Welcome to Perfection's Clutch Installation Lab. Today we've got a 2003 Hyundai Tiburon GT V6 six-speed with about 103,000 miles on it. Now the car was originally built with a dual mass flywheel and these use a pull type clutch. Now there's been many times where people have had a little bit of a problem even taking the transaxle off of this engine on the Tiburon series. There's a special trick and I'll demonstrate that. And there's definitely a serious trick to putting the release bearing on the transaxle, that's the easy part, and then correctly locking it in to the pull type pressure plate. Now, Tiburon, that means shark. This car, this clutch installation has taken a bite out of many professional shops and do-it-yourselfers. So let's follow a few of these simple tips and techniques, and we're going to take a bite out of this Tiburon. So get some popcorn, get some Coke, Let's go after this Tiburon. Well, this is our starting point, and somewhere underneath here, they tell me there's a transaxle. We'll find it in a little bit. But let's take a listen and see what one of the driver's complaints was about this uh, vehicle. Well, there's the slave cylinder and the release arm. Tim, go ahead and push the clutch pedal. I think you can hear we're getting some kind of nasty creaking sound out of this. So that's one of the things we're going to cure. Now I've already disconnected the pin, the clevis pin for the slave cylinder push rod. This is the release arm. This has to be removed in order to get the transaxle off. All it is is one nut up here. You take that nut off and take this off, this release lever. It's on a master spline shaft. It'll only go into one position. Here's the observation we want to take note of how little it moves right now. This is connected. Later on when we put it back in and before I connect the bearing, this arm is going to move a lot because it won't be locked in. When it locks in, it'll only move a little bit. The other thing too is I'm expecting that we're going to see this position further over here because when we put the new disc in there, it's going to be thicker, it's going to push the diaphragm spring out, push the bearing out, and this release arm will be further over here. I took the nut off that release arm and just lift it up and there it is. That's what keeps the transaxle locked on. Now this shaft is free to rotate and it'll come right off that pull type bearing. Now all I have to do is basically remove the transaxle, everything else, shifter cables, some electrical stuff, and yeah, all the fun stuff comes up next. I'm going to need a bigger wrench. All right, Tim, try and slide it off carefully. That looks better. Watch your angles, please. Read those gaps. Now the transaxle is out, and this is the release fork from the transaxle. So when it was installed, it was like this. When we removed it, it rolled out from behind the ears and came out. For the release stroke, the release lever is going to rotate the shaft. It's going to pull the bearing away from the engine, right? Hence the name pull type clutch. And these have been used for many, many years now, varying designs. So we've got a pull type clutch. Bearing moves towards the transmission, pulls on the crankshaft. Now this is just an observation. We're going to study this a little bit more. But when you push on the clutch pedal, you're pulling on the bearing, pulling the diaphragm spring away from everything, and we're releasing the clutch. Watch what happens during the initial movement here. The whole system moves away from the flywheel. So this dual mass flywheel is allowing the secondary to move with just a little bit of force, and then we start to go into the release stroke. Here we go. This one's been a little bit warm. A couple of observations about this flywheel. 
got some pretty good uh, hot spots in it so this has been uh, used a little bit. It is a V6. When you look at a dual mass flywheel you will see some fairly easy rotation of the secondary to the primary. That's part of the way they work and I believe flywheels of this style do have some rock to them. There's a certain amount of that that's allowed. But the observation that caught my eye that uh, a little interested in is this in-out movement just with my hands just pulling on these screws that I put in there. So this flywheel is coming off in a minute and do that I'm just going to use this T55 Torx bit and my little flywheel lock. And the last bolt And there's our flywheel. Well, we've got the used flywheel in the clutch lab now, and I'm trying to understand what happened that allowed it to move in and out, the secondary, so much. I made an observation that the thrust ring was further out on the stem than a comparable same part number new flywheel. You can see the new one, the thrust ring is much further back. So we took the used flywheel, went to a little lightweight arbor press we have, and put it on there and I just pressed down lightly on that thrust ring and it popped down to the position you see it now. So with that thrust ring being out further away from what I believe was, was its original clenched position, did that allow the secondary to move so freely in and out? Well we've got a new solid flywheel coming up next so that'll take care of that. Now it's real important to hold the flywheel while you're taking it off and what's worked for me pretty well is I've got a couple of old flex plates that I took sections out of. That's a flex plate from an automatic transmission. I just use the teeth and uh, use a bolt going into the block and it's worked out pretty well now on many different applications. Let's say we're going to reinstall a dual mass flywheel. So let's assume this is our new dual mass flywheel. We've got a new clutch disc. Which side goes where? Well, let's see. I'm going to put this side here. And then I'm going to give it a quick check. It rocks. That's telling me that this part of the flywheel is hitting this part of the disc. That's not acceptable. No good. So we're going to put it in this way. Okay, now we're down on the friction material. That's good. Let me put the cover on. And I'm not going to use the dowel pins because they're real sticky. Let's drop it down. Okay, now the common observation is, is that the retainer, this diaphragm spring, is sitting on the hub of the disc. Right now, it is. The diaphragm spring is pointed down. It's, it's pointed in like this. Let's bolt this system up. This diaphragm spring is going to come up, and it gives us the clearance so that the diaphragm spring, the retainer, the bearing is not touching the top of the disc. So if you ever have any doubt about which way a disc goes, let's turn that into a tech call, get it answered. Many discs are marked. This one is not marked, but this was the original disc, so the factory knew what the orientation was. No problem. Put that one in backwards, you get to do this again. This is a disc actually made by the same company, it's the same disc, that a customer did install backwards. Instead of having that side facing the transmission, they had this side. So it was sitting up, not sitting flush. So when the customer bolted it up, it pushed down real hard right here. And this disc, all the way around in this drive plate, is cracked. This cost them a complete transaxle installation. Now I cleaned the back of the engine and the back side of the flywheel. And I put a pin, a bolt, I cut the head off, put it up there at the, about the 11 o'clock position. You can see this, it looks like a dowel pin hole, there's no pin in it. There's a matching hole in the flywheel. Pardon me if I get in the way of this picture here, this shot. This flywheel, for an unknown reason, has a staggered bolt pattern. 
So lining up that hole with the corresponding hole in the crankshaft gets everything lined up. So now that I've got two bolts started, just take the pin out, save that for the next time. I'll put a drop of medium strength thread locking compound in each of the bolts, start the bolts, and then we'll begin the torque process. Now my little piece of flex plate flywheel lock is in place. I use just a ratchet and seated all the bolts on the flywheel. Use a torque wrench. I'm going to go to about half of the torque value. Go around a staggered pattern and then come back and finish it off at about 55 pound-feet again in a staggered pattern. And now we're set for about 55. All set. Now for the transaxle, I removed the clutch fork. It actually comes out pretty easy. There's a bushing on the top. Take the bushing out, slide the fork up, and it comes out. So I've cleaned up where the fork goes into that little aluminum boss right there and put a pretty decent dab of grease there. Put the bushing back in the top. And that's about it for the fork right now. It's all cleaned up. Now the clutch release bearing, we put this little tag on here, little tie wrap. I'm going to go ahead and cut that off, but it says, do not install bearing into cover. For procedure, see the bulletin. So what we do not want to do is accidentally or on purpose lock this into the clutch cover because that's just going to make extra work. But to start this process, if you can see it, this bearing, the part that rotates, it's off-center. This is called self-aligning. Right now it's up that way, so I can take the bearing, snap it, and it will move and reposition. So for the installation, all, I want to, all I'm asking to do, suggesting to do, is that you just visually try to align the bearing with the carrier. This is going to put this snout on the center line of the input shaft and make it easier to install this on the transmission. So we're going to slide it in. What we're going to do is pick up the bearing with the fork and just for demonstration I'll put the release arm on. So this is engaged, this is released. Engaged release. Now if you remember when we took the transaxle off and said so we have to remove that arm, if you leave the arm on it only goes so far so the whole clutch is still locked onto the bearing you're not going to be able to get it off. But as soon as you remove that shaft it comes off. And this bearing is a non-metallic bore so no grease, goes on dry there it is. We include a package of spline lubricant in the kit. Just tear it open, squirt some out, distribute it across the spline. The input shaft is made of steel. The hub is made of steel. Uh, that means corrosion. It's inevitable. But the grease helps prevent the corrosion. When you get the corrosion on there, the disc doesn't slide well, and you've got shifting problems. Now, every installation I do, I always clean up the input shaft very well, very well. Get all the gunk off of it, get the rust off of it, just lightly lubricate that spline. Don't over-grease it. 
and it's grease. We never, ever use anti-seize right here. Never. And carefully picking up the disc with clean hands and don't contaminate any of the friction surfaces. Slide the disc on. Slide it off. Index it. Slide it on. All we're doing is distributing that grease around. When I'm done, I'm going to wipe up the excess. It'll be all set with the disc and the release bearing. And the disc has a flywheel side orientation marked on it. Something that we stress a lot is you have to have a clean friction surface. So using brake clean on a clean rag, and clean the friction surface where the clutch friction material rides and rubs. That's cast iron. A lot of times it'll have a preservative on it to keep it from rusting. So you want to make sure you take that off. Spray a little more brake clean on there and clean it off. Nothing from the solvent tank. No fuels. Clean rag, brake clean. And you repeat that process for this surface right here. There is no need to dip the entire clutch in solvent. Just clean the friction surface. All right, flywheel's clean, pressure plate's clean. Put it on the pins and just start a bolt or two to hold it. And then we'll hit the tips and tricks on this part. This is real important for getting this thing to go together. Okay, all the bolts are just real loose and they've all got a drop of medium strength thread locking compound. Now the disc is free to move around, so I'm going to pick it up with the alignment tool and push in against the pilot. Now, this doesn't have a pilot bearing. The transmission doesn't use, doesn't have a provision for a pilot bearing. So there's kind of a just a pilot hole there that the tool goes into. So all you gotta do is snug these bolts up a little bit and that'll trap the disc. But as always I want to check the alignment very carefully. Make sure that I really feel I've got that disc centered. If not, that transmission is not going to go in too easy. And I'll get bit. All right. Pull the tool out. Slides right in. I think we're good there. Okay. Tight. Crisscross pattern. About half turn, three quarter turn at a time until they're snug. And then we're going to torque it. Okay, so let me run those down. We'll be right back. Okay, the bolts are seated. And the torque on this, we're only going to about 19 pound feet. All torque. Now we're all bolted up. Two things. Look where the ring is. I purposely put it so that the split in the ring is pointing down. There's two little fingers up here that hold the ring. I think this offers the best lineup. Remember I pre-aligned the bearing. Kind of put it right on center because it's going to come in here and lock. I've got the bearing positioned correctly but I've got the ring where I think it's going to be in the best spot for that bearing to lock in. Now the transaxle is installed, we just put a few bolts on it, and I put the release lever on. Now let's take a look at how far the release lever moves with it disconnected. That's at least twice as much as it did. So now to connect the bearing to the pull type clutch, I need to push this lever back as if I was compressing the slave cylinder. So I gotta go that way. 
You heard a nice click. Took a little bit of force, a little bit of an awkward angle for me. We're actually up here on a ladder doing this. And there it is, locked in. Now to get better access to remove this line, I took the two bolts out for the reservoir and there's a spring clamp that holds the line onto the master cylinder. Remove that and I just have to disconnect this fitting and unbolt it. Now all of these flared fittings really appreciate a flare nut style wrench. It wraps around, has a little slot to go over the line. Let's take just a minute and talk a little bit about master cylinder design. It may help understand the process we're going to do. Fluid's coming in here and it's coming out here. There's a piston over here. So when the piston moves forward, something over here has to close off and prevent the fluid from coming up and going back into the reservoir. There's a little tappet valve in there. So when the piston, as soon as it moves forward, it closes off this port and fluid can't go back. When the pedal comes up, when you engage the clutch, just at the last second when the pedal is coming up, this port reopens and the fluid just equalizes. So the pressure in the line, the master cylinder chamber, and even the hose going up, it all goes to zero pressure. But what if, in the process of setting this up, if you had the push rod adjusted too long, now the push rod can only go back so far because there's a pedal stop, an up stop. So if I make that push rod too long, I can effectively close off this little valve over here so that when the pedal comes all the way up, I'm still holding pressure on this system. That's not gonna work. We have to have it at zero pressure when your foot is off the pedal, but in the same hand, as soon as I start to push the clutch pedal down, I want that valve to close off rapidly. That's the first thing that has to happen. That valve has to close, then we start to create pressure. So if you happen to set one up and there's too much slack in the system, the top of the pedal is just going to be moving forward to close off that little valve. And the designs vary. This one uses a little tappet valve. A lot of the older systems use piston port. Different style, we'll explore that in a different video. Now to install, there's a foam gasket that I put on. I'm gonna leave the plug in for just a minute. Put it back through the dashboard. and just get it lined up on the studs. So I'll attach the line, attach the nuts, and put the reservoir back on. Well, this is the new slave cylinder. We've got new copper washers there. So we're gonna just put one copper washer on each side of the fitting, tighten that up, and then we'll start the bleeding process. All right, let's bleed this system. Now, I made the first connection here and I'm not going to install the slave cylinder on the transaxle just yet. Let me fill the reservoir and then what we're going to do, we're just going to try and gravity bleed and I want to see some fluid come out right here because that's the high point of the slave cylinder. When it's horizontal and the bleed screw is in its natural position, that's going to be the highest point at the bottom of the system. So hopefully we're going to get a lot of air coming out and then some fluid and then I'm going to close the bleed screw. I'm just going to open that bleed screw and the fluid level is already dropping in the reservoir. Okay, we've got fluid coming out. Snug up that bleed screw. And you're working with brake fluid, so it's a good idea to keep a wet rag nearby. You don't want to get it on the paint. That's a customer's car you probably work on or your pride and joy. Okay. Gravity bleeding. But I don't think it's bled. What we're going to do now, I'm going to 
reset the camera so you can see the reservoir over here. And all I'm going to do is compress the slave center with my hand. We're going to push bubbles out the top. Now we're looking straight down into the reservoir. The master cylinder pushrod is attached to the pedal, but right now it's not in what I'd consider to be the adjusted position. I've got it set up, let's call it slack, so that I am certain that that valve inside that master cylinder is open. If it was closed, I wouldn't be able to push fluid back in and through and push bubbles out. All I'm going to do now is, just with my hands, compress the slave cylinder and hopefully we'll see some bubbles come out that reservoir. So far I've put a reservoir and a half of fluid in there. Wasted very little. A little bit came out of the bleed screw during the initial fill. But I'm going to use this slave cylinder as a pump and just push fluid back, pushing air bubbles out the top. I'm going to cycle this a few times now. And again, an additional technique that we use and have done pretty well with is just tapping on the system. And sometimes if you've got a, uh, a stuck bubble, look at that. That helps get those last bubbles out. We don't want any bubbles in here. Zero. One other thing to think about while you're doing all this, literally look at the system and kind of do a cross-section view of it. And think, if I was an air bubble, where would I hide? And how do I position the parts so that the air bubble can get out the easiest? When we did the initial fill, the slave cylinder was in its as-installed and used position. I've changed the position to where the line, where the line enters and exit, that's now the high point. And that allowed any of those air bubbles that were trapped in the slave cylinder to go out the top. Now for the initial master cylinder pushrod adjustment. Right now the pushrod is purposely short from the initial installation. So I can freely compress the slave cylinder just with my hand. That's moving fluid from the slave back to the line back to the master. Tim, make the pushrod a little bit longer. Okay. okay. Right now, I can't compress the slave cylinder, so that means that valve is closed. Tim, shorten the push rod. Okay. Still can't compress it, shorten it a little bit more. Okay. Now I can compress it. We'll use this as our initial starting point, check to see if it's bled, and make final adjustments to the pedal system later on. Well, the installation of the solid flywheel, the new clutch, slave cylinder, master cylinder, all done. There was one added degree of difficulty on this installation that we had to work around. The entire front end has a perimeter subframe. We finally wound up having to drop that down, suspend it, and that gave us enough room to get the transaxle out. Did add a little bit of complexity to the job. But on tech support, the calls that we get on this series of applications involves, I can't get the transaxle off. I've removed every bolt, cable, everything there is, I still can't get it off. You need to remove that lever off of the, cl the clutch cross shaft fork, and then it'll come right out. And then snapping that bearing in putting the ring so that the open end is down, taking the self-aligning bearing, moving it to where it's kind of centered on that guide tube, then locking it in, you get a good crisp snap, and you're all set there. So really, a couple of small techniques, and this becomes a very doable job. And uh, my little friend here,
I think he'd like some of his teeth back. So before he has a chance to take a bite out of you on your next clutch installation, please call Perfection's toll-free tech support hotline, 800-258-8312, press 4, your call will be routed to tech support, and we'll help you with the clutch, flywheel, or hydraulic question on that passenger car or pickup truck.